And now, let's move on to our next guest. He is an English film, television, and stage actor. He has an impressive career, his first TV series credit being in 1997. And he's known for numerous roles, such as Marcus Crassus in Spartacus, the founder in CW's The Tomorrow People, the International Express Man in Good Omens, as well as Julian in Dominion. We're also looking forward to watching him in The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, a project he might actually be able to tell us a thing or two about. So please welcome Simon Merrills. Hi. Hello. Hi. Am I working? Yes, I'm working, yeah. Perfect. Right. Thank you so much for joining yes. us. Please take yes. a seat. Thank you. How is everyone? Hot? Yeah? Yes. Why, why did I wear a jacket? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so, as always, I will be asking Simon some questions, but feel free to line up at the microphone um, if you have any questions, and I'll hand him over to you. Uh, wow, okay. As soon as, as soon as I can. But before that, can I ask, is this your first time in Romania? It's not my first time in Romania. I, I actually live in Bucharest. Um, wow. Yeah, my wife is Romanian, and um, I've kind of lived here on and off since 2018. So uh, I'm working in the UK now, but I came back for this, for you guys. That's very nice. So you're very familiar with Bucharest. You can show me around. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Um, before uh, talking about any of your projects, I would like to know um, how you handled the pandemic, artistically speaking, and did you take a break? Did you continue working? I know a lot of people were sort of... Well, you know. the pandemic was uh, a crazy year for everybody. Um, yeah. I was very lucky because I was in New Zealand shooting Lord of the Rings, but uh, I went um, early in the year to New Zealand to start shooting, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. So everything stopped. I couldn't leave the country. I couldn't get back into Romania because the borders were closed. My partner was here. I was very privileged because I was in a nice hotel waiting to work, waiting to film Lord of the Rings, a great series. But um, I was there for nearly a year. And I was meant to be there for two months. So um, it was a crazy year but one that um, I'm grateful for, you know. So that was my experience of the pandemic. I was in New Zealand on the Lord of the Rings, uh, not Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And so I want to jump in and just talk about Spartacus because yeah. I feel like a lot of people here know you for your interpretation of Crassus. Yeah. And um, we also, well, Romanians love Spartacus, really. We also had Manu Bennett, like, a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, that must have been exciting. It, it was very exciting. He's, <laughs> he's very entertaining. Oh! You that, the stories he had. <laughs> um, so I was curious to know, uh, what's it like to play a character that's based on a real human being? Is there more pressure on you to sort of get it right or something? Thing more than with a fictional character, completely fictional? Well, you know, um, the actual Marcus Licinius Crassus um, was 72, you know, 72 uh, AD, so we don't know much about a long time ago, but the, there is stuff recorded about him. Plutarch writes about Crassus in the lives, the Roman lives, and reading that was incredible. And also the training that we did for the roles, the training took a month of boot camp, and then we continued training after that. So after six weeks, I had my first day of filming as Crassus uh, with Hilaris, my slave, who was training me to fight like a gladiator. And um, I've never felt more ready for a role in my life. It was a wonderful role because with Crassus, he always knew something that nobody else knew. He was always planning ahead. And it was just a, a fantastic part to be given. So I felt a responsibility to get it right for the last season of this wonderful show. I wanted to get it right because the other seasons have been so good, you know. Um, but I'm really happy with what we did. I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of Spartacus, very proud. 
And the show already had such a huge fan base and everyone loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, I mean, it's 10 years later and I still get people writing to me from all over the world, young people who've just discovered it for the first time and they love it. You know, there's something about that show that goes beyond, it's about what it's about and also the way we shot it, the way it looks, you know. It's, it's pretty unique, I think. I don't think there's another show quite like it still. So um, I'm very proud to be a part of it. That must be really exciting for even younger people who weren't maybe around or they were too yeah. young to see it back in the day, but um, to yeah. kind of... Well, I have a son and uh, he's 11 weeks old. Oh my goodness. So uh, thank you. He's beautiful. He, uh, it's hard to get him to sleep, but he's beautiful. But um, it will probably be a long time before he can watch Spartacus. <laughs> so yeah. You don't really mind that people know you as Crassus, right? Because I know no. there's a lot of actors who are sort of like, oh, I did this role and now people will know me as this person forever. I don't care. I, don't, I love it. I love it. I mean, I want to keep working and I'm doing another... I'm filming now another show in the UK, um, was that me? Um, which is a very exciting show, so you move on, you go forward, you do other roles, but I am very happy to be known for my work in Spartacus because it was a great experience, a life-changing experience. So. In a uh, 2013 interview, you actually called this role a gift. Um, because yeah. you're able to show so many layers of Crassus. Yeah. And I think the writing also helped a lot. It's such beautiful writing. Yeah, layered, layered intelligent writing with plot and subtext. That's what you want as an actor. You want to be saying one thing but meaning something else because that's interesting. Yeah. You know, that's what's interesting. And a, and a character like Crassus was always one step ahead of everyone else. So I loved it. I loved it. And also to be helped to get in that kind of physical shape was great. You f to feel that fit is a great feeling. I'd never been to a gym before that show. I'd never done any exercise. I'd never been to a gym. So that show changed my life, you know, so. Yeah. Are you always looking for uh, layers in your character, even always. though they might not be in the writing, like even for smaller roles? Always. Yeah. Cool. Because it keeps it interesting for you. Yeah. And it means that you're providing layers and tone in a character. Yeah. Um, be before we hand it over, I have uh, one last question for you, which is about the Rings of Power. Yeah. Um, a little bird told me that you're able to reveal a few things, not in too many details, but what can you tell us? What can you tell us so far? Well, um, it's, I've never known security on any production I've been involved with. I've never known security and secrecy like it, which is good because it means it's going to be a big, fantastic surprise. Um, I think I can reveal, I hope, because Amazon might just now zap Shoot me from you. the sky. <laughs> I think I can reveal I'm playing an elfish character. Um, my story is tied closely with Arondir, played by Ismail Cruz Cordoba, who's fantastic. But the whole production the little bits that I've seen, and obviously doing the work, uh, the hairs are going up on my arm now. This show will be mind-blowing. You won't have seen anything like this show. It, it's going to be incredible. Incredible. A great, a great cast and just a great concept. That's so exciting. Really exciting. Very cool. All right. Let's see our first question. Oh. I wanted to ask you about uh, your work on Good Omens, where you play a very, very small role, yeah. and it was smaller on the book. Yeah. How did you work with the creators to expand that and bring such a great humanity to the screen? Oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Well, and, the, uh, the director of Good Omens, Douglas McKinnon, I'd worked with him on a show called Nightfall, and he, 
he got in touch with me and said, look, I want you to audition. I want you to tape for this role in Good Omens. He said, it's not big. It's not big, but it's a really sweet, it's a good role. And he, I'd never done comedy on TV. It's not, you know what I mean? I'd never, I'd never played a role like that. I'm usually on a horse with a sword, you know. And I'd never played a role like that, which allowed me to be gentler and um, more comedic. And as I read it, I thought, yeah, these are small scenes, but this guy's a real human being. And there's real pathos there. He loves his wife. He loves his wife. And then when he's going to die, he, you feel that sadness. Um, so actually, I loved it. I loved, I loved doing it. It was really, and we, of course, we shot, it in, we shot it in Cape Town in South Africa. We shot in the freezing uh, river by, by London, you know. So we shot in all these different locations. Um, and always the uh, international delivery guys in his shorts, you know, the same outfit. And it was great fun. It's great fun to do it. Were you a fan of the book before? Um, Neil Gaiman I'd heard of before. I hadn't read Good Omens. I did read it when I got the role. Um, and of course, it's magical. It's wonderful. I mean, and I met Neil, and Neil is the nicest guy. And he's like this genius who creates all these worlds. Like, he keeps creating these new worlds. And, um, but the guy is very, um, very, very humble and very interested in you, you know, and it, it, it's, it's amazing meeting somebody that accomplished and then you realize that they're so accomplished because he's interested in other people, you know, so um, that was a great experience, yeah. Thank you. I will say it was really funny, you know, seeing you, like you said, on a horse all the time and all that. And I saw you in Good Omens and I was like, oh my God, this is such a different vibe, so such different. a different character. But it must be refreshing though. Yeah, it was nice to do. I've done a lot of comedy on stage in the past and I love comedy, but on TV I'm never cast like that. It's my face. I don't know, something about my face. He's not funny. <laughs> Give him a sword. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, how was the Rings of Power experience for you? Were you a fan of the franchise, of the books before, or was this entirely new for you? Um, I was a fan. I mean, fan is a funny word, isn't it? There's, I loved the movies. Um, and I, I always had a strange relationship with Tolkien. I'd never got through all the books. I'd delve in and I'd love them, but then I'd get distracted, and then I'd go back. It's purely the, the density of the world that he created and the other languages. I mean, I read The Silmarillion when I got the role, and um, that is almost like reading Genesis. It's like reading a new Bible with a whole new mythology and language, and it, it's incredible, the detail. So. Because I was in New Zealand and because of the pandemic and because I got stuck there and because I was waiting so long to film my role, it actually helped because elves are immortal. And I was thinking about what must it be like to be immortal? Would it be this gift or would it end up being a curse? And in the book, Tolkien says, elves are immortal they can be killed, but if they're not wounded, they will not die, unless the weight of years adds such a melancholy to them, such a weight that they fade away from sadness. And that was like, my God. So I imagined this character I'm playing being 10,000, 20,000 years old. And just thinking about what that would do to your vision and the way you interacted with the world and so actually waiting to do it <laughs> helped <laughs> but um it was a magnificent an enormous machine to be a part of with human parts you know great cast great cast you're gonna love it looking forward to seeing it thank yeah. you thank you Hello. Hi. Can someone lower the microphone yeah, for this way? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Hello, first of all, allow me to thank you for sharing your time with us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and I have a twofold question for you. Yeah. I would be really curious to know uh, what would be your favorite character to play if you had any choice in the world. And the second part, what you, would you be most reluctant or afraid to play? Huh, that's a very good question. It's funny, actors get asked a lot, what do you want to play? And the, f the thing is, being an actor, most actors, I'm one of them. I don't have some big plan. My life and my career has kind of... I've been in a boat, but the river has taken me. So I've gone along with the river, you know, and it seems to have taken me in a certain direction with a certain kind of role. I have no problem with that. Um, as far as characters I really want to play, I suppose, that would be going back to a theatrical thing, more of a stage thing that could be on film, but I don't know, maybe a classical role that I haven't done that I would like to do. I can't really say the name, but it's the Scottish King in Shakespeare. <laughs> I think, because we have a tradition in the UK, you can't say that word because the, it's bad luck. Um, but uh, I think it's a great role. It's a great role to play because it's a ruthless man destroyed by conscience. And that makes him human. You know, yeah. that some people say that him and his wife, the king and lady, they say that they're psychopaths, but they're not psychopaths because a psychopath doesn't have any conscience. Yes, exactly. But they're destroyed by conscience. So, for me, the humanity in any character is what's interesting. Um, so I would like to do that. Any role I wouldn't like to play? Oh my God. I, um, well, there's certain kind of work that I don't want to do. I, I, I'm not really interested in um, soap opera kind of stuff anymore. No, a lot of it can be great. I mean, I've done some in the past and there's some great people, but that kind of factory thing isn't my thing. So uh, I probably wouldn't like to do that kind of stuff, maybe. But um, anything else I'm open to offers, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. You have to uh, raise it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how in Lord of the Rings, there's a guy with a big eyeball. Uh, why don't they just fly the rings into the volcano at, uh, at the end of the movie? Why don't they just fly them with the birds so they didn't have to take the entire journey? It would that, be easier that way. That is an incredibly good question. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You just wanted to get that off your chest. <laughs> uh, you can answer it. Yeah. Well, I wasn't involved in the movies, um, so... I don't know why they didn't do that. I mean, there are always these plot points that you can notice that the, that the uh, creator would have used for dramatic purposes that afterwards you think, hold on, why didn't he do that? But you have to switch it off, I guess. You have to switch off. Not everything is logical in a story like that, I guess. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. Right, okay. <laughs> that was it. That's that. That was it. He was. He was like, I'm done. I asked. I'm done. I'm coming um, in for that, and then I'm going. <laughs> um, until uh, we get a new question, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about your stage career because I know you've done quite a bit of Shakespeare, um, and I was wondering kind of like a long time ago. Yeah, and I was wondering what you like about it. What's different um, from TV and film and stuff, and uh, anything you'd like to share. Um, well, before I did Spartacus, I'd done an, uh, quite a bit of TV, but nothing... I always thought of myself as a theatre actor. That was where my heart was, and that's, that was my arena, and I understood it. And I always felt kind of out of place on a TV set. I didn't really get it completely until just before Spartacus and then Spartacus changed things for me because I realized that if the camera is there you can do nothing but just think about something and it's powerful and then I started to enjoy that 
But before that, on stage, you know, I'd done some productions that I thought I can never beat this experience. I did uh, the stage version of On the Waterfront, which was a famous movie with Marlon Brando in the 50s. And I played that character, I played the Brando character, and that was an amazing experience. Um, I've been on stage with my brother in Shakespeare in a comedy of errors as the Antiphili twins, which was a hilarious production with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And using that language, you're using a different muscle. Physically on stage every day, maybe eight shows a week, it's a very physical job. And you have to be fit, you have to be ready, but mentally, mentally ready as well. So. I've done one play in 10 years of television and film and going back to the theater, it was like a shock. It was like, wow, okay, you know, it, it's, a different, it's a different thing, it's a different muscle and I, I miss it, but the money's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> Not even on Broadway, like I'd say. I don't know, you were talking earlier about the roles you'd like to play, the roles you wouldn't like to play. And I was wondering if you'd like to do any Broadway at some point? Oh yeah, I'd love to work in America. I'd love to, I, I'd love to work on Broadway. I'd, lo I'd love, that's why, like to do a theater show now, I would love to do it, but it would have to be something immense. It'd have to be something great for me to want to commit to it because a theater is a big commitment a rehearsal and then a tour and then a run it's it's quite a big commitment for an actor so it would have to be special but i'd love to be on broadway my god a musical not a musical i sing nicely in the bath it sounds good in the bath because it echoes and i can convince myself that i could be in a musical but um a m musical voices are very different they're very uh it's another skill. You mentioned earlier about your brother, and I know you did some work with him. Yeah. What's, it, what's it like like playing with your brother? Oh, it was fantastic. We're very close. We're both actors, obviously. And uh, we both went into the, the business a similar time. We have very different careers. Um, but we're very close, and uh, we always support each other, which is great. So when one gets a job, congratulates the brother, the other brother does the same. So he's always happy for me. Because some people say, oh, your brother's an actor. Isn't that weird? Aren't you jealous of each other? No, it's like, no, we support each other. So um, it's great having a brother in the same business. Cool. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Hi. So, so you're British, married with a Romanian, right? Indeed I am. Okay, so I have two questions for you. Uh, are <laughs> you're not from the government, are you? <laughs> no, 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 okay, no. Okay. unless you're applying for yeah. citizenship. My tax number, I've got my tax <laughs> number here. No, so two questions. So are there any cultural clash stories inside the family you could share? Uh, you know, you living with a Romanian. And two, if you'd have like foreign friends coming to visit you in Bucharest, and you would need to organize a food tour around Bucharest, which places and dishes would you organize? You know, add to the list. Well, it's got to be, I mean, I'm lucky. I'm lucky in my wife's uh, family. So whenever I eat Romanian cuisine, it's always made in the kitchen. You know, so sarma, mich, um, you know, um, what's the beginning? What do you, what do you, what, 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 do, you what do you have with the, with the sarma? Sarmale, like Mumalika? Yeah, Mumalika. Mumalika and uh, her grandmother and her mother, they're such good cooks. So I get fat easily when I'm here, so I have to say no more Sarma, you know. Uh, but I love it, I love it. Um, her fa I mean, uh, so many people speak English here, it makes us lazy, makes me lazy, and I, I have to learn Romanian. I, you know, it's essential. Kretka vorbesk my mult, my mult, vorbesk, yeah. <laughs> um, because my wife's um, family don't speak English, her immediate family. But the first time I met them, I spent three hours talking with her father and her uncle in different languages with whiskey. 
So, whiskey friends, I think. Whis Narok, whiskey friend. So, um, we understand each other without having the same language. But um, more and more, I know, I have to learn. I have to learn. Yeah. Well, there comes a point okay. where communication goes beyond language. Yes, you know? ex ex exactly. So. <laughs> but whiskey helps. I think you also asked about the cultural cl clash. Is, was there any cultural There's clash? There's no story? cultural clash that I can see. I mean, you do have a different... You know, it's nice here. It's extremely family-based, you know, family-oriented, you know, and you, you, you have the orthodox thing going on. I'm, I'm not from that tradition at all, but I'm not from a religious tradition at all, but I, I actually find the orthodox stuff kind of beautiful, you know, to see. It seems fun. I've, seen, I've been to a couple of weddings. Well, the, the, the wedding and, and the, uh, the priest will stop doing something and then he'll make a joke with the couple and then they'll have a chat and start laughing. So it's not like very, oh, oh, serious, you know. I mean, it is serious, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I don't like it when the taxi drivers are crossing themselves as they're driving. It's like, guy, it's okay. The, it's okay. Dr drive for now, you know. <laughs> Is it when they go past the church? I think it's every like, time. Think, every time, yeah. It's like whoa. <laughs> Hands on the wheel. <laughs> um, let's go back to your acting career a little bit. You you touched on this a little earlier about the industry and such. But what's mo the most terrifying thing to you being an actor? Insecurity. It doesn't matter what you've done. Um, insecurity of the business. Don't go into the business unless you can't do anything else, unless you don't want to do anything else. Unless there's no way that you can face life without um, working in your passion. Because it has to be a passion. It's not a business to go into to make money or be famous or all of that stuff. You know, that might happen, that might come, but it's not about that. There are many, many people in this business who barely survive. And especially when you have a family, it's very, very hard to make a living. So that's the frightening thing, because you can be riding high, and you can finish a great job, and you can think, ah, oh, I'm fine now, but then it goes quiet. And then you're back in that state of waiting, waiting. Now I'm a bit easier about it, because I think I just let it happen, and, and I think, Something will come, something will come. But it's the insecurity is the, is the tough part of my job. Actually, when you're doing the job, that's like a gift. It's a gift. To love what you do is a gift. So I'm, I'm lucky. But I think trusting it is one of the most difficult things and just letting it happen. I know yeah. that at least earlier in the career, you're just always kind of looking for the next thing. You're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Yeah, and you can get, you're told to be very ambitious and very forceful and very, and it's good to have ambition to get better at what you do. I, I, every job I do, I want to get better. I'll be in training to the end of my life. People say, oh, you must reach a point where you know what you're doing. Every job, I, I, I start from a point of fear, of not knowing what to do. And you do your work, and you get nervous, and you think everyone's going to be thinking, why is he here? Why is he here? All these voices in your head, but then they go away, or you invite them in. You invite them into the house, and you go, OK. The bad voices, the negative voices can be here with the positive voices. Let's have a party, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't remember the question. I think I went off there. No, like. you definitely <laughs> answered it. You definitely <laughs> answered it. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Hello, sir. Hi. Uh, because you talk about, and you do an amazing job in Spartacus, like a supervillain. Are you ready for a James Bond supervillain? <laughs> My wife keeps saying that, and I say, darling, thank you, but I'm too old. <laughs> Never. I mean, Daniel Craig did such an amazing job, but you have to remember, he started 15 years ago, 16 years ago, so he ended at roughly the same age as me. I don't think you can start. <laughs> uh. 
if there was another Bond with Bond in his retirement, you know, I'll do Bond in his retirement. Yeah. Very different genre too. Yeah. Be like comedy. Yeah. Thank you. You look like you're going to sing. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> okay. uh, you've done so many characters. Is there any character you'd like to revisit or if you could go back in time you'd like to play again? Oh, that's a good question. Because every time you do a job, you always think back at night in the dark. Like the job I'm doing now, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great job. And um, we're all really excited about it. And every day is like a hard, full-on day, but we always feel good. But you lay in bed in the dark, going over what you've done, thinking, ah, I could have done it like that. I could have done it like that. And maybe if I'd have thought that. But then you have to let that go, because it's done. But when I think back to parts I've done, with, 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 um, with Crassus, I can still go back and look at it sometimes and think, oh, I could have... But it's pointless. It's there. And if people like it, which they seem to like, then I'm happy with that. You know, so I, I don't think I'd want to change anything. Maybe some jobs that I did way, way back in the past. I, I put my head in... Uh, I hope they burn the tapes. They must burn them, you know. Um, but I wouldn't want to change anything because it's done. You made your choice then and that's it. Done. You know. Thank you. Thank you. So do you go back and watch yourself? Is that you're like, oh, I, today I'm going to watch. I don't, like, I don't like watching myself. Um, some actors on set, you will film a scene. You'll shoot uh, a take. And then one of the actors, they'll go straight to the monitor and watch the playback. And to me, that's crazy. That's crazy because to me, the job is about feeling and trusting your feeling and trusting your colleagues. If I look at myself as I'm working, then I think about how I look. And you don't want to think about how you look. It doesn't matter, you know? So I don't like to watch, I don't like to watch myself now, but you have to. With, with Spartacus, it took me one year to watch it. Um, and I watched it with a friend, a colleague, uh, a, a Romanian actress called Anna Ularu. Oh my God. I think She's you know great. Anna Ularu, yeah? Yes. Well, I, I did a film with her um, t about 10 years ago called Index Zero. It, it hit some legal problems, so they had problems releasing it afterwards, which was a shame, but we loved doing it. And um, we would come back from filming in Bulgaria and she would say, Simi, let's watch your show, let's watch Spartacus. And I'm going, oh, really? Yeah, she said, we watch one episode every night. And I went, okay. And actually, because it was one year later, I was able to watch it objectively. So I wasn't obsessed with my performance, it was just I was another character in the show. So I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but it, I had to have that distance, you know? Also, you were talking earlier about you can't really look at yourself because you're going to think about what you look like. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think if the thought is there, um, you know, and you're doing your job, like, the, it will come across. And you were talking earlier about how there's something in your face that seems to not be funny, that you always play <laughs> these characters. And I think I was looking at the pictures um, of you for when, like, people, when you give autographs and stuff for people. And it does, you know, there's this this aura that comes across, it's very much like, okay, he knows what he's doing. And I think it all comes from the thought of, that you have in the moment while you're filming, right? I often have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, it looks I, like it, it, you do, you do. I, 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 I swear in the mirror in the morning trying to get my contacts in. Uh, I go into the makeup chair at 6, 7 a.m. And then slowly you wake up and then slowly you start to turn the engine on, you know, and hopefully by the time you're on set, you're ready. You've done your work, you're ready, you know. It's very exciting. I'm doing a show now, a filming in Britain. It's called The Winter King. And it's based on the Arthurian story, King Arthur. 
but told from the perspective of a real history, not myth. So it's a tribal British Dark Age warrior story. And um, I think it's going to be great. Every day is exciting going into work. I haven't felt that excited since Spartacus, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Are there any more questions for Simon? Yes. Hi. Hi. So uh, you were talking about the boot camp from Spartacus. Yes. And I was wondering if you did something similar when you did Nightfall, because it, uh, we did another one for Nightfall. Yeah. It I wasn't quite as extreme as Spartacus, because the aesthetic of Spartacus was, as you know, a lot of flesh revealed, a lot of naked, but a lot of everyone. The aesthetic of the show was people had to look ripped, and it's great to feel like that. It's great. It's hard to get there, but it's great once you're there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but with Nightfall, we did do a small boot camp. We did a lot of horse training, obviously. We did stunt training with the stunt team, a fantastic stunt team. And then you do your personal training to get in physical shape. So, but I, I always do that on jobs, because I like to feel a certain way, because it's my, my instrument, you know. It's the same with the Winter King. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own training for that. There's no boot camp, but we have a lot of riding. So we're doing some riding lessons again. Thank you. Yeah. I saw that more often than not, you end up with a sword in your hand. Exactly. Uh, do you enjoy doing uh, sword training? I love it. I love it. It's great fun. It's great fun. And it's great fun that, you know, people still think uh, it's believable that I can be doing it. <laughs> You know, yes, put him on a horse, give him a sword. Yeah, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because also I think it can go wrong in so many ways, like having, um, you know, this world that's very, very different than what we're experiencing right now and sort of have all these actors do these battles and stuff like that. It can go wrong. It can look silly if you don't it do it right. It can look silly. Yeah, the aesthetic on the show I'm doing now the director doesn't want elaborate, pretty, stylized fights. He wants it very real and brutal and ugly, which it would be. It would be. And uh, so that's nice that we have that in our heads when we're doing stuff like that. It's the quickest way to kill this man the quickest way not in a way that looks pretty but quick and brutal um, so that's the director's aesthetic which is a good one I think it's truthful um, but I love the training I always love that and I love horses uh, I'm not a horseman I, I only ride in shows but uh, they're always it's such a privilege to meet these beautiful creatures and you know, to get to canter and to gallop, if they let you gallop, it's great, you know. It's, oh my God, it's so exciting. Yeah, I love it. Going back to what you're saying about what's the quickest, quickest way to kill this man, I think we sort of moved away from those films. There were a lot of them a few years ago in which, like, you're going to kill this man, but then you first have a conversation and, like, yeah. you say the last words, and, oh, I've been meaning to kill you forever, yeah. and then, yeah. okay, just kill him already. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I think yeah. that's a lot more truthful. Of like, all right, I'm going to kill you right well, now. Well, it would have been a very, a very, uh, a time in Dark Age Britain, 480 AD, not long after the Romans left. Britain, um, where it would have been lots of tribal fiefdoms, lots of tribal kings and lords, all brutally bustling for position, for primacy. And so life would have been extremely cheap. And there would have been no, there would have been no honor given to women or children's lives at all. It was a very brutal time. So I think it's important to reflect that if you're making a historical drama, to show the reality, to try to show the reality. And I think we're going towards that in this show. It won't be released for like another year at least, but uh, I think it will be very exciting. If you're fans of shows like Spartacus and Nightfall, I think 
I think you will love it. Cool. Hello. Hi. Hi. So I wanted to ask you, how does it feel to impersonate so many different roles and live through them? Does it give you a new perspective on your own life or how does it change you? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, I'm not a murderer. <laughs> what? Of course. I, but I feel anger. I know what it's like to... I know what it's like to feel anger. I know what it's like to want something badly enough that I'm prepared to sacrifice something for it. So you adapt a story to yourself. I mean, the role I'm playing at the moment, it's the most hardcore role I've ever played. I have to do things as this character that are really, really extreme. And I must admit, I'm having really strange, disturbing dreams. Because you, you do, as an actor, you, you take yourself to a place of imagination whereby you have to imagine yourself committing these acts. Why would you be doing it? Are you just crazy or is there a reason? There has to be a reason. So if there's a reason, what's the reason? And so you lack, latch on to that. But I must admit, I am having some really disturbing dreams that are not pleasant dreams. Um, but they're only dreams. I woke up from one dream thinking it was real and it was like a nice relief to know that I hadn't actually killed anyone. <laughs> so can you give us one example on Tell us about what, at least one dream of yours. I beg your pardon? An um, example of a dream. I had a I don't know if I should tell you, really. Um, well, it's very simple. Um, because of the role I'm playing, it's different from the, from the job. But I had a dream that I, that I had killed a woman, that I had burned her body, and that I had mixed her ashes in with the earth to cover my crime and I felt so guilty in the dream and so terrible it was a terrible feeling but it's because of what I've been thinking about playing the role because playing the role I do some terrible things and you have to your imagination is a very powerful very powerful tool it's my main tool as an actor my imagination you know, so you, you activate your imagination. You go like that, come on, come on. And so in your subconscious, your subconscious starts to play with you, which is good for an actor, it's good. But it can lead to some nightmares, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't any... know if I should have told that story. No, I, I, I loved it. It sounded very ritualistic. Yeah, yeah. It makes the, the well. There's a lot of the ritual. Earth. There's a lot of ritual sure. in the show. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 And you've done a lot of projects in which there was like, yeah. killing is a thing. Yeah. Right. The killing's a thing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Graphically. <laughs> right. You didn't get any angry calls yesterday after after we talked about the rings of power, did you? No one killed you. You look still alive, so no. that's all good. No, I was worried uh, that uh, maybe I'd given too much away, but I think not. I th you mean about the Rings of Power, yeah? Yes. Yeah, it was the most secretive production I've ever been involved with. Uh, the security was extraordinary. We couldn't even call each other by our character names on set. We had code names. So the security was through the roof. But it's to keep everything secret. Um, but I think... It's okay to have said what I said yesterday, which is that I'm playing an elf commander. That's all I'm going to say. That's not at all a lot of detail, so I think, think you're safe and we're very excited to learn more about it and for it to come out. So, um, We also learned yesterday that you have quite a few connections to Romania, first through your wife and then through actress Ana Ularu, right? Yes. Yeah. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in, in playing either a Romanian personality or to like being in a part part of like a Romanian production. Uh, there are there are some fantastic actors here and filmmakers here. I know that the the problem would be a language problem for me, I guess. But if there's an English or an American character, you know, I, I'd love to I'd love to work in something like Umbre. I saw Ooh, yes. Umbre. I thought that was a really good show. 
you know, very good actors, very dark, and um, I recognized Bucharest. I mean, I was talking to my wife about it, and she said, yeah, I mean, they, they only show the the uh, CD, the CD side of Bucharest. There's another Bucharest as well, obviously, but um, in that show they they made it look like one kind of city. Um, but I love that show. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I'd lo I'd love to work here. I'd love to film here. Yeah, HBO did a great great job with that. Like, it's such a strong, like, yeah. so character oriented. It's it's, yeah. it's really good. And I yeah. think it was like the first. TV show of that caliber that we had here. So yeah, yeah, great performers, great actors. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, I want us to go back to Spartacus for a little bit, and uh -huh. I had a curiosity about Marcus Crassus, which was like, if he were to be alive today and go into the world as a political leader, uh -huh. do you think he'd kind of take the same approach that he did in Spartacus, or adapt? Well, one of the most famous quotes of Marcus Crassus is, no man can call himself rich right. until he can finance his own army, personally, which he did. He actually financed his own legions. So he was that rich. So I suppose you've got to think Bezos and uh, Musk and, you know, people like that. But. Um, he also probably was, well, maybe they're as ruthless in some ways, who knows, but in his time, Crassus had a, a, a very loose attitude to how he was going to make his money. He bought a lot of property, he ran a fire service, but some people think he actually set fire to the buildings so he could buy them cheaply afterwards to amass this huge property, um, you know, portfolio. But um, he was a fascinating character to play. I mean, he lived in a different time. He owned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slaves. But he didn't own slaves to massage him or to act as hand servants. He wanted engineers. He wanted specialists. So he considered them fine tools. So he was an interesting, an interesting villain to play. I loved it. I loved playing him. What would you say are the three most important characteristics of Crassus? Oh, um, the way he can read other men, the way he can judge an enemy, his respect for an enemy, in this case Spartacus, that was an important thing about playing Crassus, that he respected Spartacus. And that was the way that he thought he could beat him, by respecting him and understanding him. And also, I suppose, his values, the values that he had, even though he was ruthless and at sometimes vicious, he did live by a certain personal code. Uh, and I suppose that's why people like the character as well as hating him, you know. Yeah, I think people really like to see characters that kind of like stand by why what they say. Yeah. Like they really believe in one thing and kind of like rule their life according to that code that they have. I mean, yeah. in the beginning, he takes it so seriously. He's training with his gladiator, Hilaris, and he takes it so seriously that he says, "Try and kill me, for real. If you don't try and kill me, I'll kill you." If you kill me, you get your freedom. So he, he wanted to be truly tested uh, as a fighter. And I think for the first episode to be introduced to Crassus like that made the audience go, hold on, this guy's a villain, but I like him. You know, yeah. it was a great piece of writing for me to work with. You know. I think we like most villains that we see. I think there's something about watching villains that's just very, make us, makes us lean in, kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as actors, we do like to play them, but they can't be one-dimensional. It can't be, oh, I'm evil because I'm evil. You have to play a real person and to find a way to make them human. I wanted to also touch a little bit about your role in uh, The Tomorrow People. 
Oh. For, for the people who don't know, that was a CW show about a group of people that were homo superior, right? Like the next stage of evolution. And yeah. um, you play the characters called the founder. And I know he's sort of considered to be a monster. Um, but, I mean, I saw some scenes of, like, you were, you were uh, battling against Steven. And it looked so cool and, and amazing. Yeah. And I, I was wondering what you can tell us about that role. Oh, it was great fun because uh, when you have uh, telekinetic powers, and this guy was meant to have very strong uh, powers in this way, so he could stand there like this and just pick you up with his hand and then throw you against a wall. And it's great fun to be able to do that. And we did that in one scene. And uh, they had a stunt double, and he's on a harness. And so I just pick him up like this and then and the guy is pulled by the uh, other stunt team. They're pulling him, and he smashes against the wall and then falls to the ground. So it's great, it's great to um, play a part like that, where you have that supposed power, you know, and you can see what people are thinking. You know, it's great to play with that. It's fun, you know. Did you wish you had more time with that character? It would have been nice, you know, it was one of those shows that people enjoyed, but then it didn't go, I think they had two seasons. Seasons, yeah. Um, so, sometimes that happens, you know, the money people go, no, nah, no, and you don't do it again. So, on other shows, you go on. So, it, it would have been nice to explore more, but it's okay, you just move on to the next thing. Another big credit of yours was uh, Julian in Dominion. Oh, and yeah. in that, you sort of played a, a character that's half human, half angel. Yeah, half correct? human, half angel. What, what's it like to even, is it fascinating to even like kind of, you, you're given a role, you're like, yeah, this person's half human, half angel, good luck. Well, the fun thing about him is he's meant to be thousands of years old and he's meant to have changed with his life as a human. And so I played him as a kind of like rock and roll, you know, he's got all his jewelry and he's got his, um, he's got his uh, makeup and his uh, nail varnish on one finger. And it was fun to play something, you know, so outside of me, <laughs> you know, uh, a kind of rock and roll bad boy angel. So um, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And on a very different note, like kind of the opposite side of the spectrum, you were, you were talking yesterday about playing, potentially, like wanting to play Macbeth. Yes. Um, the whispered Scottish king. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, they can't hear us here. It's too loud. Can't hear it. Can't, can't hear anything. Um, but I was wondering if you'd like to play him just on stage or in a film. Would you be open to that? Do you believe that like Shakespeare can be done? on film as well? Well, yeah, there's been some great versions on film. In fact, one of the best versions of uh, Macbeth, I'm going to say it, nothing's happened. Uh, one of the best versions of Macbeth, I think, was Roman Polanski's Macbeth in 1972 because it was so brutal and it had been just after Roman Polanski's family were murdered, his wife was murdered, and he made this film afterwards and it was so graphic, but you see the time that this is set and the people's lives and the way that they treated their enemies was brutal. And so, I, and also the actors in that movie were fantastic. John Finch and Francesca Annis, wonderful actors. So um, it can be done well on film, but it needs a great director. It needs a great director. You mentioned yesterday that you were filming for something. I think it was The Winter King, is that yeah. correct? Um, it wasn't on your IMDb, so I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. And did you read the book? And Yeah, I've read the book since I got the role. Uh, the Winter King is three novels about the Arthurian story, King Arthur, but it's taken from the viewpoint of him being a real Dark Age warrior. Not King Arthur with the Holy Grail and the Round Table, none of that. So he is a tribal warlord trying to unite the British tribes against the Saxons. There is a Merlin, but he's a druid. He's not like Gandalf, there are no dragons. So it's really set as closely as possible to a true historical scenario. Um, because the writer Bernard Cornwall 
is a great historian as well as a dramatist. So uh, we are very excited. I, I'm, it's one of the most hardcore parts I've ever played. Um, it's 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 going to be stunning. I think. Yeah. Can't wait to see it. And um, before I hand you off to the audience, I was wondering if uh, do you know any of the other guests that are here at Comic Con, and have you watched like the stuff that they've been in, like Outlander and Lucifer and Vikings? Like, kind of like what's your genre that you like to watch? I've seen some Vikings over the years, yeah, and, uh, and The Walking Dead with Ross Marquand. You know, I've seen those shows. I love those shows. You know, I like anything that's good. I can switch around genres. I don't have to watch one genre. Uh, and I think now we're in this golden, golden age of TV, more so than movies, I think. Yeah. I think there's better quality TV than movies often now. Um, you know, better writing, better stories, better characters. Uh, so I've watched a lot of stuff recently, yeah. It's also something that people can binge watch. They kind of just like they get attached to these characters yeah. and then they follow them throughout all these sort of situations rather than a movie is just kind of like its own yeah. thing. I love yeah. to do that. I, I try and stop myself from watching too many so that I don't run out, you know. Um, Ozark, I loved. You know, Ozark is fantastic, you know. But I remember years ago when The Sopranos came on. Oh. The Sopranos like blew the whole thing out the water. It was the greatest thing that had ever been made. And then you had Breaking Bad and The Wire, you know, some British series as well. But the Americans really, they really set the uh, standard. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Are there any questions for Simon? Any questions? You can line up at the mic. Hi. Hi. Uh, you played uh, Crassus, but then uh, on Legends of Tomorrow, you played uh, Ju uh, Julius Caesar. Oh, yeah. How did you approach the different roles? Oh, uh, well, you know, um, Legends of Tomorrow was a bit of fun, really. Um, it was hilarious. You know, Caesar finding himself on a beach at a frat party in modern day California with lots of American students running around in togas. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, so that was just a bit of fun. Um, you know, whenever you're working, you take it seriously. You want to do a good job, but, um, you know, it was what it was. It was a bit of a laugh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, you talked about the Tomorrow People. And yeah. I wanted to ask you, is there a certain ability or power that you would like to have and why? Uh, I've, I've thought about this sometimes. You know, people say, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? And people obviously think of, I'd like to fly, uh, I'd like to be invisible, or I have great uh, super strength. That's all fantastic, but in the real world, I my superpower would be to speak every language in the world so that wherever I went even if it's on a hill in Mongolia I can talk to the guy with the goats you know uh, to be able to talk to anybody in their own language would be a, uh, an amazing gift I think to be able to communicate with everybody you know I'd, I'd love that but I'm well, too... <laughs> you already speak Romanian. Oh, so. yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Buona dimenata. Ah, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Molte and, and then I guess the follow-up to that question would be like, if you were to play any superhero, what would you like to play? Uh, that's, a, that's a funny question for me because um, I'm not really... I like the Batman films, I, I will watch them like anybody, but I don't obsess about um, the Marvel movies. There is a point, they, ha they all have great actors and really good production values, and they're exciting up to a point, but then I switch off. I, I can't keep watching over three hours of... Because it's all like, if only I had super strength and I could do this, and 
it, it, I'm more interested in a bit more human stories than Superman stories. Although, as a kid, when the first Superman movie came out with Christopher Reeve, that was a world event. That was so amazing. I thought Christopher Reeve was fantastic because he was humorous. He was, he was a bit funny. And you had um, the fantastic Lex Luthor, you know, the guy playing Lex Luthor in that film. A big American actor. His name's gone out my head, but uh, uh, I loved that as a kid. Um, what superhero would I like to play? Um, a new one, really, that I don't know about yet, probably, rather than any that I know about. Huh. Yeah. I like that. Invent one, and I'll think about it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi there. Uh, before you played the historical characters, did you, uh, have you done your own research on the actual persona in history? Yeah, because I enjoy that. I mean, when you're an actor and you get a job, your Bible is the script. If you have nothing else, it's okay, because you have the script. The script is all you work with. But I'm the kind of actor who likes, or person, I like to read. I like to research. I like to find the human little bit of nugget like that. So I was very happy to discover the life of Crassus is written by Plutarch. So you have a whole chapter on Crassus. And it's amazing. It reads like a, a thriller, his life. And, and Caesar as well. Um, and there was one thing that gave me the key to Crassus. And it was a senator in Rome at the time of Crassus. He was very brave. And he would speak out against corruption. He would speak out against bad politicians. He had no fear. Because in those days, you could be killed for doing that. But he said, I will not speak against Crassus. And he was asked, why would you not speak against Crassus? And he said, because he's a bull with hay on his horns. And at the time, if there was a dangerous bull in a field, the farmer used to put hay on the horns of the bull to warn people, don't go near him. And I thought, fuck, yes, that's, a good, that's good for me uh, to play that character. He doesn't have to show it all the time, but the fact that he is capable of inspiring that fear, it's good. It was a great thing for me to read. So I love I loved to research. I have a second question. Okay. Uh, when you play a villain character, yeah. was there a moment while acting, while filming, when you said to the director, uh, can I please um, repeat this scene because I'm not evil enough? Uh, I, I've often asked to redo something, but not because I'm not evil enough. Because you can't play evil. You can play somebody with desires and actions who wants something. What they do to get that thing, other people might call evil. In another scenario, so uh, blowing up a family in one scenario is evil. You could, we could all say that's evil in any scenario. And yet, if we're on the side of the good guys and a family gets blown up in a war because they belong to a side of the bad, then we convince ourselves that, oh no, that's okay. So evil to one is not evil to another. So if I'm playing a villain, I have to play a human being. And if I'm doing something terrible, why am I doing it? Am I doing it just because I'm crazy? Or because I'm a sadist? Usually that's boring. You know, it's better to know why you're doing something for a reason. And then you find the human being. And then you can play that. And I like to confuse an audience. Like, I'm, I'm playing a character now in Winter King who does pretty terrible things. But they all did terrible things. And I, I want to confuse the audience by presenting a human being who does terrible things. Not a monster, you know? 
So you try to play a, a human, not a, a monster. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, they were saying the same things about playing a character like Hitler, for example, because like a lot of people think Hitler is yeah. the worst person that ever existed, and I yeah. tend to agree. But then, yeah. when you're an actor and you need to play him, like you're not just going to go around judging him. You kind of have to get inside. Well, it's where like, it's he thought he was right. It's where his obsessions and where his his mental illness, really, yeah. his obsessions, his drug addiction later on. Um, his obsessions due to his personal history, and it all starts, like Freud said, with childhood. You know, his obsession with the idea that, you know, Germany had been betrayed, and then it, and it becomes fixated on this group of people, and then it grows and grows and grows, and because he's able to um, express himself to people, then they start to hear it. I mean, hatred is, is a very, it's catching like love is catching, like a wonderful, uh, somebody who can inspire a feeling of light and love. They can have a real effect on people, but so can the opposite, somebody full of hate. Because we all have both in us. And you only need to say to somebody, you know that feeling that you have, grow it, grow it, grow it, make it more. It's them over there, it's them over there who are causing your problems, it's them, you know. And suddenly, people are on board with this madman. So Hitler wasn't a monster, he was a human. But he did monstrous things, you know. So that's, that's our world. That's the world we live in. And we see it all the time, like the divide and yeah. like the, like yeah. what kind of inspires people to go, all right, I want to follow this person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And do, and do things which are terrible. Yeah. But you become, they, they become convinced that they are doing them for the right reasons, you know. Yeah, for sure. Hi. Hi. What's, your, what's your favorite thing about being in this industry? Uh, doing the job I love. Um, I, I'm lucky in that when I go to work, I'm, I'm doing work that I enjoy, that is my passion. And I'll be a student in for my whole life until my last day on set where I'll fall over like that. Uh, you know, I will be learning. I, I learn on every job I do. I'm a student still. So I'm, I'm privileged to do a job that I love. You know, the in-between stuff, the insecurity, then I accept that as part of the deal, you know? Um, yeah, you asked what I love about my job. I love everything about it. I, I can't imagine doing anything else now. It's, it's, <laughs> it's too late for me, you know? So as long as people still want to hire me, then I'm hireable. <laughs> Also, didn't they say, don't do this job unless you can... No, don't do it unless it's... It's the, absolutely you, the you one thing. You have no choice. That it's your passion and you can't imagine doing anything else. Because there's no reason to do it apart from that. You know? Yeah. Do you feel like that, that was true for you when you started acting? Like you were like, yep, nothing else works. I, yeah, this. at school. I was in school and I, I didn't particularly enjoy my school life. But um, age 13... Uh, the English teacher had a school play, A Man for All Seasons, by Robert Bolt. And he cast me as 60-year-old Cardinal Wolsey. And I was 13 years old, and uh, I studied Churchill, like how an old man would walk around and speak. And I took it very seriously, and being on stage was the most thr thrilling thing that had ever happened to me. And uh, seeing the audience and feeling that you could have a power in the, those hours, and you, you're transported and they're transported, uh, I thought I want to do this for the rest of my life. So that's what made me want to do it, really. Wow, beautiful. The Thank buzz. you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, hi. Uh, do you have a favorite book, and what would you like to do the adaptation? Do I have a favorite what? Book. 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 Oh, my God. I read all the time. And this is one of those questions where you're put on the spot and you go, and you forget ah, all the books. <laughs> um, well, you mean like a classical book? Whatever kind. I mean, 
I love a wide selection of genre. I like, I like the great um, espionage writers, you know, Jean Le Carré. I like uh, um, Georges Simenon. Uh, I love, I love Dostoevsky, of course. You know, I like high and low literature. As long as it's a writer of skill, I'm not uh, snobbish about, oh, it only has to be high literature, you know. But um, I don't like reading on a computer or a tablet. I like a book. I like to come home and have sand in the book. And then years later, you open the book and you see sand from the beach you were reading it on and some of the sun oil on the pages, you know. So I like a physical thing to carry around, you know. Although Kindles are amazing, you know, as well. They <laughs> save paper. Uh, and which adaptation would you like to play in? Which? Which book would you like to adapt to the screen? Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. Which book would I like to adapt to the screen? My God, there are, there are so many. Well, personally, I mean, I, I love what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm loving the fact that, you know, the Winter King trilogy has been adapted for the screen. And you always lose some things. You're not putting a novel on screen. You can't. But um, they're sticking pretty closely. They're, they're massaging some things, they're changing some things, but it's a pretty close adaptation of the story. And I think it's a great trilogy to put on screen. Even though there are a lot of historical dramas, my feeling is The Winter King will stand out. It will be very different. Yeah. So I'm going to cheat and say that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so we all know and love a lot of actors who can play like great protagonists, great heroes, and we already know you make some great villains. <laughs> what kind of role would be a big challenge for you to, to portray, uh, but you would like it anyway? Yeah, every role is kind of challenge. I challenge myself in every role because if it feels too easy, then I feel suspicious of that and I need to make it difficult for myself. Um, you might, look, say you get an audition to tape. You might have one day. So you learn it in one day and you tape and you go with your first instincts. And then maybe you get the job, maybe not. Say you get the job and then you think, ah, I got the job. And then you think, ah, now I have to do all this work all this work and I need to make it really difficult for myself to come out the other side of the tunnel. Even though for the tape, all you did was use your instincts. So in a way, trust your instincts, but also do the work. I mean, a, as a challenge, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, somebody very different from myself. I mean, I'm not a villain. I've never killed anyone. But uh, so, <laughs> you know, the, the, those roles are certainly different from me. Um, I mean, nowadays it's difficult because when I came up as an actor, an actor is a vessel who is meant to play roles, many different roles, who aren't themselves. But now we're entering a period where you more and more are expected to be the type of person, the same sexuality, the same, you know, you, you have to be that person in real life as well, which I don't understand so much because I'm an actor and I came into this job to get away from myself, to be other people. Uh, you know, as a, I draw as well and I like to draw. So I, I see characters as a sketch as well. I start to sketch them from within myself. I use myself as material, you know? Um, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a character of a different genre, uh, a different gender, maybe. But that's not going to happen now. There'd be too much, you can't do that. Um, I think it would be interesting, maybe, you know. Maybe further in the future. Maybe, maybe further in the future, who knows? We'll get there. Yeah, maybe. Thank you maybe. so much. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Any last questions for Simon? 
It's the last day of Comic Con, so that means the last panel. So, do you have more photo ops and autograph sessions today? I do. I have uh, several throughout today. If anybody needs that, so also go then say I'll be hi. Over there. It's for them, for him. Any last burning questions? Where's the air conditioning? <laughs> That is a burning question in more than one way. That's true. Bring your own. <laughs> I saw people like had like fans around their necks. Yeah. Like to fan. That's a really good idea. Maybe we should get some. All right. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Simon again. Merrills, everyone.